Hello, and welcome to part four of our lecture series on the female reproductive system. And in part four, the last of the series, uh, we're gonna take a look at the vagina uh, as well as the mammary glands. Now, we just finished up with our discussion of the uterus. Uh, the final structure uh, is gonna be the vag vagina uh, associated with uh, the female reproductive tract. And similar to the uterus, we were gonna have a muscular tube-like organ um, but with the vagina, it's essentially going to extend from the cervix uh, to the external genitalia. And so uh, the function of the vagina is to help direct the spermatozoa through the narrow opening of the cervix into the uterus. And so uh, what we're going to see is that the vaginal fluid is going to be involved with increasing sperm motility, uh, essentially priming the sperm as well as delivering it into uh, the uterus. Uh, and then from there, it's going to pass from the uterus into the uterine tube where fertilization uh, may be occurring. The vagina is going to be lined by a minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, and again, uh, this is going to be um, a kind of mucous membrane, which is going to allow it to have a good protective mechanism because we've got many cell layers that are going to be present. We've got a moist surface. Uh, but if it's subject to abrasion, it's not going to damage uh, the vaginal wall. Now, the cells uh, are going to be a little bit different from what we've seen in other rare areas where we've had a minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. These cells are going to start to accumulate glycogen uh, that ultimately is released into the lumen as these cells are exfoliated or sloughed off. And uh, bacteria that are found within the vagina uh, are going to essentially metabolize the glycogen, which results in a production of lactic acid and uh, a low pH, or in essence, a, a protective um, kind of acidic environment uh, within the vagina. Again, these are, in essence, good bacteria, and they're going to be producing an environment to try to minimize harmful bacteria from getting in and being established uh, within the structure. And so that finishes up uh, the organs associated with the female reproductive tract. Uh, we're also going to have an accessory gland uh, within the female reproductive system, and these are going to be the mammary glands. And so what we're going to be looking at are going to be an accessory gland or an accessory secretory structures uh, that are mainly derived from the skin. And so if we take a look at this, we're going to see what are going to be a compound tubulo-alveolar glands. And so uh, they're going to be in essence, a, a tube-like structure at the beginning point, kind of closer to where they're going to be releasing their secretory product. And then at the kind of the base of the tube, deeper within the tube, they're going to go into alveoli or clusters of uh, secretory cells. A compound meaning that they have lots and lots of these clusters that are going to be present there. Um, within the mammary gland itself, they're going to be anywhere from about 15 to 20 lobes of these a secretory units, which are going to be separated by white adipose tissue and dense connective tissue. Now, the cells themselves of both uh, the secretory component and the duct systems are either going to be lined by a simple cuboidal or a, a simple columnar epithelium. And so what we're going to see is that uh, the secretory cells of the mammary glands are going to be specialized for the synthesis and secretion of milk uh, to nourish the infant. Now, in a resting mammary gland, in essence, a, a non-pregnant, uh, the mammary gland of a non-pregnant individual, what you're going to see are the lobules are going to be separated by some loose connective tissue, uh, relatively few of those secretory alveoli. So you can see the, the darker, uh, simple cuboidal epithelial cells. You can see what look like uh, little duct systems. You can see kind of the more condensed uh, secretory alveoli. Uh, but in general, there's not a whole lot of cells there. So there's not kind of a dilation of the, of the lumen. So these cells are essentially just there in a resting uh, state. Uh, as we get closer to where the cells are, or the secretory product is being released, uh, we're going to have the lactiferous sinuses, and essentially that's going to be lined by a stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, but the majority of the structures within the mammary gland are going to be lined by that simple cuboidal, or in some areas, simple columnar epithelia. Now, during pregnancy, what's going to happen is we're going to see uh, hyper... Let me have skipped this slide. Yeah. Uh, during pregnancy, under the influence of those hormones that are being produced by the corpus luteum, um, 
like uh, estrogen, progesterone. Uh, it's going to trigger uh, a variety of hormonal changes uh, within the uterus. It's going to trigger a variety of hormonal changes within the pituitary gland. Uh, it's going to trigger the release of prolactin. All of these things are going to uh, start to accumulate and trigger changes within the cells within um, the mammary glands. And so what's going to happen is we're going to start to see uh, intense proliferation of the cells within the ducts as well as in the secretory alveoli. And so what's going to happen then is we're going to look at the fact that we're going to have many more cells being present and the terminal cells, the cells at the end of these ducts that are going to become more and more of the secretory alveoli are going to differentiate from their kind of resting stage into milk secreting cells. And so it's this very intense proliferation of both the ducts and the secretory alveoli which cause uh, the mammary glands to become enlarged during pregnancy. So again, on the diagrams to uh, the right, we can see many, many more of those darker simple cuboidal cells being present uh, during pregnancy. And this is looking at the later stages of pregnancy in these diagrams. Uh, and then finally, uh, during lactation, essentially with the loss of the placenta uh, at birth, we're going to start to see a decrease in estrogen and, estrogen and progesterone levels. And so initially they were produced by the corpus luteum. Ultimately, during later stages of, uh, of pregnancy, that production of estrogen and progesterone would be taken up by the placenta. If you remember back, I think two lectures ago, we talked about the corpus luteum only being present up to about six months. That starts to break down the uterus, uh, the placenta, uh, produces the estrogen and mm -hmm. progesterone through that last trimester. Uh, but then when the placenta is lost uh, during childbirth, uh, that is very dramatically going to decrease uh, very abruptly. Uh, that's going to trigger an increase in prolactin. And so the, the balance of a decrease in estrogen and progesterone and an increase in prolactin is going to stimulate the cells that have essentially been built within the pregnant mammary gland to become secretory. And so what we're going to see is the secretory cells are going to be local on the cuboidal, and they're going to be involved with synthesizing the milk products and secreting those milk products. And so what we can see in a lactating mammary gland is the presence of secretory products, essentially milk products, uh, within the alveolar and duct lumens. And so lots of dilation because it's accumulating materials as well as materials that are going to be present within that. And so you can see that uh, within the, the micrographs to the right hand side of this slide. And this finishes up our discussion of uh, the female reproductive system. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Uh, this finishes up the female reproductive system. Uh, and so we got one more lecture uh, within the, the histology course. Uh, the next lecture is going to be taking a look at what's occurring within the, within the male uh, reproductive system.